Yeah, it works both ways. I have an office very close to the coffee machine. So whenever I need to grab a theorist, I just have to wait after lunch and someone will always show up. That, that's very convenient. Okay, yeah, thank you, Simon, for the introduction and thank you for having me here. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm also originally from Italy, from Verona, which is a bit far north. So it's, it's a good occasion for me to, to fly also back from, from the US. And uh, as Simon was saying, I will give you a little bit of an uh, experimental overview of LHC with some focus on ILUM LHC. And if I had to summarize in kind of one slide, what this talk is about is essentially from where you get from protons to how you get to plots in the end to actual final results uh, of the analysis. Um, so there are, of course, some disclaimers to be made. Uh, obviously, the LSC and iLuminosity LSC is a, a pretty massive collaborative human endeavor. And at any given time, there are more than probably 20,000 scientists and engineers working um, on, on the various projects. Uh, so there are many different experimental setups, hundreds of journal publications per year. And, uh, and there are so many different clever solutions that are adapted to make the whole things uh, happening. So during these lectures, uh, of course, I won't try to be comprehensive, but what I wanted to try to do is to go through some of the topics that, uh, that I want to cover and give some fundamentals. And then uh, I want to show how these fundamentals are actually can be found and applied uh, into the experimental solution that we adopt. And, uh, and I will try also to give some, let's say, useful facts that I think every, both experimental and theorist working on LSC results or analysis should know. And then obviously um, I will try to A, focus a little bit on the things that uh, have some personal bias, but also give you some idea of what will change going towards ILUM LSC and uh, what is, uh, uh, what, what's coming up in the next few years. So th this is sort of my, the outline for the next, uh, for, the, for all these lectures for the, for the next five hours. So I will basically start with uh, talking a little bit about accelerator. So I will give again a little bit of basics and some useful facts, especially uh, for LAC. Um, I will spend quite a bit of time, most of the time, I have to say, uh, talking about detectors in vector reconstruction. I want to give you some ideas of the technologies that we adopt, where they come from and how they're used and what are type of things we are keep changing in our detectors and what's coming up in the next years. So I will give some general concept, but then focus a lot on tracking detectors, uh, particle identification and calorimeters and jet reconstruction. Um, I will also want to show you a little bit that after we uh, have our data shipped out of the detector, what happens? So I will talk a little bit about data handling. And, uh, and this involves both triggering these events, data, the data acquisition system, and how we prepare data for physics analysis. So um, the, the ones of you probably have worked in LSC, the first experience was some sort of Antipole or some uh, pre-formatted amount of data. So let's see uh, how we get there. And then a little bit about simulations. Now, if time allows, I hope so, I will also say a few words about more data analysis and I will focus a little bit more on uh, statistics. And um, let's see how, how far we go. If, if really, really we go a little bit, uh, if we go a little bit further than I thought, I will try to add a few more slides tonight, but uh, uh, about reinterpretation, which I also wanted to touch, but otherwise I think this is already plenty of content. Okay, so let's start with some uh, warm up. okay? So this, this is a slide I've been showing to the last couple of years to prospect graduate students that come uh, to Berkeley. And uh, you probably know this very well. This is uh, a picture of the LSC. And uh, this is a collider has been colliding proton and ions, different center of mass energies. We have four interactions point in about 100 million proto-proton interaction per second since 2010. So the question is like, and I've been carefully wording this, how many experiments are active at LSC? So any idea? And here I have a few options for you. 
So shout. 40? Okay. Anyone else? Eight? It's a good bet. Okay. So the official answer is technically eight, and uh, these are listed here. My favorite answer is more than a thousand. And the reason for that is probably you've seen a little bit this morning is that compared to many other experimental setups that we have around in physics and using particle physics, when those protons collide, what happens is actually not fixed. There are a, a huge number of reactions that can happen. And each of these type of reaction can give access to a different type of quantity and a different type of physics that we might want to investigate. And to me, this is a basically equivalent of having many different thousand experiments going on. We simply just use one detector setup that is versatile enough to allow us to investigate the results of all of them. Uh, and this is also uh, shown by this, the, the impressive amount of papers that basically come out on different type of physics from LHC experiments. So this is my, my favorite answer to this question. Okay, um, talking about LEC, and since I mentioned a high LEC, let me start just showing a little bit the timeline. Um, so, well, we are, yes. So, of course, we are here now. Uh, we are in the middle of what is called the run tree data taking. So, LEC started back down here with 7TV. And so, this is the current uh, status. Um, you see that we have a little bit more of uh, time of running in run three. And in the meantime, uh, collaboration are pretty busy in preparing for very, this very long shutdown. In general, you will see this pattern where we tend to usually run a few years, collect data, and then we need to shut down for a few years. This, the reason for that is that both we need maintenance of accelerator and uh, detectors that they cannot run for that much longer as well as we like always to do better. So we take advantage of these long shutdowns to make improvements. And in particular, this shutdown here, this uh, called phase two shutdown or long shutdown three, um, is the, it marks the start of the high luminosity LAC era. And we, we see a little bit more of what, what changes here. But this basically is a major upgrade of both the accelerator as well as the detectors. And so, this, this type of plot is often shown and then is conveniently sort of then uh, uh, cut off here, which seems a small part, but you see that it goes from 2029 to actually 2040, which is a pretty long time. And in fact, there is even, uh, there is a slightly more updated, more detailed schedule that shows you what happens after this long shutdown. Um, so we have run three, the long shutdown, and then you see that the same pattern repeats. And we have a few years of data taking, a shutdown, a few years of data taking, a shutdown in a few years. And currently, the, the plan essentially to, um, is to run up to about 2041-ish. Obviously, something like this is, is very much in flux. If I actually should have shown, if I showed you this, this schedule here, how it looked uh, uh, 10 years ago, it would look very different. And right now, basically, we would be here. Uh, already, but so things change uh, depending on the situations. But at least it gives you an idea of of what's what's expected to go to go forward. And of course, there is because sort of at some point we'll end the lifetime of the LAC. We also need to start thinking about what's coming next. So this I don't have a huge amount of time to go into that part, but I'll try to give you some teasing uh, ideas of things that are important when thinking about where we go uh, after LSC and luminosity LSC. Okay, so let's start with the first part, which is um, more about accelerators. And so the first thing is that we often talk about the LSC as a sort of the accelerator, but actually the LSC is just this final part, this large ring here, where the interactions points and the various big experiments are. And uh, to get protons or ions in this accelerator, you actually need a way more complicated setup. So in fact, the, the, what is called usually the LSC accelerator complex is made by several different 
accelerators that talk together. They really manage to bridge together. And it starts down here, and then uh, the protons need to go to various stages of acceleration and bunching before actually being able to be injected into the large hadron collider. And we'll see, we'll see why that, that is needed. And then throughout the collider and also earlier, you have different set of uh, experimental setups. But yeah, and, and the other thing I wanted to mention very briefly, uh, but uh, and I'll, I'll say a few words later as well, is that the in the moving towards the high luminosity LSC, I mentioned that the accelerator is also being upgraded. And in fact, this just gives you an idea how all different parts of the LSC accelerator complex, or at least a really great, a large fraction of them, is actually undergoing work and will be undergoing work uh, to upgrade towards the aluminosity LSC. So this, this sort of aluminosity LSC era is really just something that uh, involves both the accelerator as well as many of these experiments. Yes. This red here was, I trying to, uh, let me see. I haven't checked what was done. I thought it was, I remember I, I saw some legend. Oh yeah, yeah. I think it was just um, uh, a color coding to figure out when some work was happening, the time scale of that, of that work happening. Correct. So this you see the atlas and uh, and uh, CMS. So atlas is down here, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.5 CMS. They're both in red. But this is really focused on on yeah on the LSC side. And then you see there is work here. There is work in these segments of the LSC. There is work uh, quite a bit here as well. So there is work a little bit all around. And in fact, even here you see that it's sort of focus really on the on the upgrades of the accelerator. Uh, on the accelerator side. Basically what takes you to, to sort of being able to increase the luminosity, but we'll come to that part in a second, in a, in a few. Okay. Oh, and yeah, just to say then, uh, please absolutely feel free to interrupt me and then we can see how that goes. And I've said, I've been, I left at least half of the blackboard open because whenever we can also take some tangent and uh, so go on the blackboard to sort of go a little bit more in one direction or another without any problems. Okay, so talking about accelerator, what are the main components of the accelerator? Well, you need beams. So you need basically a current of charged particles. And uh, we'll see why in a few slides, but this is not a continuous current, but it's distributed in bunches, yeah, okay? In bunches of current. And then this is transporting ultra high vacuum to avoid this charged particle to interact with uh, air or any other matter and basically disturb your beam. Then you need accelerating structures. And so the, the basic idea, as we'll see, is to use electric field to accelerate and magnetic fields to keep uh, the current, uh, your current uh, uh, within the accelerator. And so that's, that's your magnets. Um, in addition, your magnets not only keep the beam in the accelerator, but we will see how you want to basically focus the beam to as small as possible size before it inter interacts. And, uh, yeah, and then, of course, to optimize the performance, all these different pieces need to interact with each other in the best possible way. And in fact, the, the major risk are sort of in going between one piece and another. That's where you can lose quality of the beam and you can lose in the end in the performance. Yes, please. Yes, I will, will come to that. It's called radio frequency. It's RF st stands for radio frequency. And um, in a few slides, we see how these are and why they are there. So I'll try to introduce that, how we get there. And we, we'll get to talk about this radio frequency. Um, cavities. Okay, so starting from the basics, why do we even need a collider? Um, well, the, the, the reason is that when we look at for the highest possible center of mass energy, when colliding two beam of particle, essentially the center of mass energy you have is about the square root of uh, four times the energy of the two beams for uh, when the beams have very highly relativistic. So the mass of the particle sort of are small compared to the energy. If instead I had a single beam and a target, uh, what happens is that uh, my center of mass energy goes to the square root of the two times the mass of the target, which could be, for instance, a proton in an atom, 
and so on, and the energy of the beam. And so it's much, much more difficult. You need a much higher energy of the beam to reach the same center of mass energy. There are other advantages for fixed target experiments. For instance, they give you much, you can usually pack a much larger uh, rate of interactions. So they're useful to study some very use, very rare phenomena that do not require the very high center of mass energy. But when you go to, when you want to push the center of mass energy, the colliding, both colliding beams is, is really the way to go for this, for this very simple reason. In addition, Having a collider allows you your beam to recirculate and go over and go around multiple times so that if some particles don't collide the first time, which is what most of the times happen, they have a second chance, a third chance, and so on and so forth. Um, yes, that, that's basically the main things I wanted to say for this. Um, and there are also a few concepts that probably you know of, but I, I think we, we really should uh, make sure we're on the same page of. Um, well, the first thing is uh, the number of events that you expect after uh, uh, colliding these particles from beams. And that's proportional essentially to the cross-section of a process, the so-called luminosity uh, of, the, of the collider and the, time, uh, and the time elapsed. And the luminosity is, is usually measured in these units of centimeters to minus two uh, times seconds minus one, or some more often you might even see it in inverse peak of an inverse seconds. Um, and uh, the, the, the luminosity is really determined by the properties of the beam. And so one useful formula to, to sort of have roughly in mind is this one here, which gives the expected luminosity uh, for, for uh, uh, an accelerator setup where you have two counter rotating beams. And this is sort of the revolution frequency of the beam. So how often they go around uh, your, uh, your ring and for the for the LSC this is about 11 kilohertz okay um, then how many particles you how many bunches of particles you have around the, the ring and again for LSC this is close to 3000 okay that uh, that go for each beam around uh, the LSC and then you have the number of protons of course that are in the beam that are in each of these bunches and again as an order of magnitude there are about 10 to the 11 protons for every bunch uh, in the in the LSC beam. And then it's inversely proportional to the transverse size of the beams. So essentially, if you just think about the two beams, the smaller they are, the more likely it is that collisions happen. Uh, when thinking about these bunches, usually you should think that despite the fact that we pack these bunches in a transverse size of a 10 micrometers and there are 10 to the 11, still means most of the space is just empty. So most of the time, these protons will just miss each other and sometimes they will collide. And then we will see uh, how often that happens soon. Okay, um, but so the first thing we need um, to, to do the acceleration is, is, the par is some particle to accelerate. And uh, so that's what is usually called the source. And then depending on the needs of the accelerators throughout sort of the recent history, there are several particles we might want to accelerate. When we're talking about LSC, we are mostly talking about protons or ions. And then uh, um, how do you, you get these protons? Well, you actually start from just an hydrogen battle. And, uh, and then you take your hydrogen, you strip off your electron and you get your proton. Okay, that, that's roughly uh, as simple as that. And then, the, of course, the, 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 the challenge is to get as many protons as you can and transport them through. Um, another thing which uh, has been a workhorse for particle physics has been, of course, colliders of electrons. And that um, the easiest way is just to put a resistance and, uh, and essentially an electric field that strips off electrons that uh, passes a current in the resistance. But we also had accelerators that collide the protons and antiprotons. That was the case for Tevatron uh, in Chicago. And so these, you can create antiprotons, smashing protons on a target. And yeah, maybe here I haven't written, but basically the reaction, you get a proton on target that will give you a proton, antiproton, and proton. And now with magnetic field, you want to isolate those antiprotons and bunch them together, which is actually proved to be very, very difficult. And that was done at Tevatron. 
but given that this energy don't it doesn't really matter as much if you have a proton antiproton for the LHC it was chosen to just collide protons, which was much easier to uh, to source. Um, similar, you can have uh, positrons. Um, there are several ways to do it. You can have an electrobeam doing uh, Bremsstrahlungs, for instance. That's actually uh, we'll see what Bremsstrahlung is, but um, essentially you have an emission of a photon that then goes into a plus C minus and you try to select the E plus part. But we also have more exotic beams. You can have cairn beams from, uh, from protons on target, and we, have we can have beams of neutrino. So in this case, actually, you do a very similar thing where you sort of, you can put proton on target, but also this, they, they can produce uh, pions, charged pions and cairns. And these are unstable particles, and they decay, uh, can have neutrinos. So if you have a, a beam of protons and then a pion that go through that will decay into neutrino. And then what you just need to do is get rid of your charged particle component and what you're left is a beam of neutrino. This is what, for instance, at Fermilab will be done uh, to have a, a large beam of neutrinos uh, for a future experiment called, for instance, Dune. Um, and that will travel through the rocks for a thousand kilometers. So that's basically your source. So what happens after you do a source? Well, you need to accelerate it. And so this is sort of the, the, the very first most basic acceleration that you can do, in which this is a case of, of an electron beam. So you basically apply a voltage. You have a current flowing, which is basically a flow of electrons. And then what you do is you apply an electric field. You create an electric field here. And this can strip off electron and accelerate your electron. This is pretty easy. You get a kinetic energy of electron, which is proportional, of course, to the voltage that you can apply here. And this, of course, is also what limits you in how much energy you can get out of these accelerators. Um, very roughly speaking, you can get still of the order of, of almost, uh, let's say, mega electron volt out of this, although the typical energy is really below uh, one mega electron volt for that type of these things. And it's really limited by the fact that you need to have very, very large electric fields. And so at some point it means a very large uh, voltage uh, applied to this. And so practically speaking, this uh, very soon becomes a pretty limiting factor. So how can we get around it? Um, well, instead of sort of having a single large electric field, can we try to accelerate particles bit by bit? And that's basically the, the first uh, concept of uh, instead of a single static field, having a, a variable field, electric field that is used to accelerate. This is the concept of a cyclotron where essentially now you can see how the combination of electric and magnetic field is used in which particles are essentially injected and you see two halves of, of this type of accelerator. So within these two halves, there are magnetic fields that basically curve the particle and, and uh, turn it around. And then in between these two halves, you create an electric field. So the particle starts in the middle, curves around. Now, fields an electric field is to increase the velocity, which means that its trajectory will be a bit wider. And then it goes around again, increase the velocity. And so it spirals through increasing more and more the velocity as it goes through. So that's the concept of the cyclotron. And uh, you basically have this constant speed field and uh, this uh, accelerating uh, electric field. Now, if you think about it, when it, while it spirals through, when it goes in this direction, it will need a field oriented in some direction. Let's say there's an electron, you will need an electric field in the opposite direction to accelerate that. And then when it goes around, now it's going in the opposite direction. So the same electric field would just push it back or decelerate it. So you need the electric field to swap uh, in the meantime. So practically speaking, the electric field is changing its sign uh, with a frequency that needs to be the same frequency that this particle goes around. Okay, so it's basically a square wave of electric field that, that is, uh, that is uh, done here. So this is pretty clever and allows you, therefore, with a lower potential to keep reusing that potential to accelerate the particle over and over. The, of course, the obvious drawback is that this thing can become pretty big if you want to accelerate to very high energies. And at some point, it will just, that, that size essentially limits 
uh, the maximum energy you can achieve. So how can you do better? Well, that's basically how you move from a cyclotron to a synchrotron. And so in this case, um, this is sort of the, the very, very basic idea of the cyclotron. But in this case, essentially, what you want to do, you have a single trajectory, a single ring, and then you have the similar elements in which you have one some piece in which you accelerate the particle and the rest of the ring that you use to essentially curve the particle around and then some, some uh, point where uh, the beams will collide. Now to have a single ring, what happens is that you need to basically um, change the magnetic field as the particle goes through to be exactly the one you need to keep the particle along that trajectory for that particular velocity that the particle will have at that point. Um, so that, that, that synchronization basically it's, it's, uh, it's what uh, gave the term, uh, the term synch uh, synchrotrons. Um, and uh, yeah, and here it just it gives you an idea basically what happens if the particle is in relativity, you can easily compute what is the time it goes around. And so what is sort of uh, the time you need to change the magnetic field. Um, now this, yeah, at the time, as the particle becomes relativistic, this is not anymore true, but you can, yeah, it, it's, it's, it becomes a little bit more complicated, but not that much actually. Okay, um, so one example of sort of um, uh, a non-direct current, so something that uses this concept of the square wave electric field, but in this case is linear, um, is shown in this picture here. And this actually contains a lot of the elements that you can find a really modern accelerator like the LHC. So this is the situation where again, we want to use the idea that we want to reuse the same potential to accelerate the particles in, uh, in small pieces. So you apply essentially a potential to these tubes. You have tubes of some conductor, okay? And so you apply a potential and what happens is that all the tube will be at the same potential, which means that you actually inside the tube, you will have no electric field. So when the particle is inside the tube, will will be shielded. And then instead you will basically create electric fields in between the gaps of the different tubes. So now you can have a particle that starts here, gets accelerated by the first potential then while the particle is traveling inside the, pu the tube, you can actually reverse the, your, your potential such that the electric field changes sign and then is in the right, if you want, direction when the particle comes out to be accelerated again. Similar, you go through the second tube and you change again so that it's in the right direction. So you need to keep switching the, the, the voltage such that when the particle goes from one tube to another, it gets uh, it sees the electric field in the right direction. Of course, the more you accelerate the particle, the more, the faster it goes. So that means that actually the length of these tubes needs to grow as the energy, as the velocity of the particle and the energy of the particle grows. And, and this ultimately also is, a, is, a, is the lim main limitation of this type of acceleration concept. Um, yeah, and so the, the, obviously you can easily compute what is the maximum energy dependent on the potential that you apply and how much basically electric field you apply. And this is a simple formula um, that, that you can use, but it's basically just the voltage time charge. So the electric, the, the, how much basically a potential energy gets converted from here to the kinetic energy of the particle. Okay, so, this is, is, is interesting, but there is one important other concept of this, part, of this type of accelerator, that here in this schema, you see a single particle going through. We would like to accelerate groups of particles. And so you can easily see that sort of, if the particle arrives at the wrong time, it will find the wrong electric field and actually will be pushed back, okay? So that's why sort of this type of, uh, acceleration schemas, they need to work on bunch, uh, on bunched type of currents, because if the current arrives at the wrong time, it will just not see the correct electric field and be pushed back. So that already tells you that these particles tend to be bunched, but there is an actual, another property, which in practice is very useful. And is that 
in practice, we never use sort of square waves. It's actually very hard to make square waves. What we end up using is sinusoidal waves of potential, okay? And so when you have a sinusoidal wave of potential, that also means that the electric field here is not gonna be a constant. It's gonna be also, it has been a kind of sinusoidal wave uh, with time. And so the, the a group of particles that travels through, depending on the slide, on the time of arrival, we see a slightly different electric field. And so there is a sort of magic phase, if you want, that is your central phase where the particles see uh, some amount of acceleration. But then what happens if a particles arrive a little bit later, is a little bit behind? Well, if you, if you tune your beam to be around this, uh, this particle here, the particles that arrive a little bit later, a little bit uh, later, um, will see an actually higher electric field. Okay, which means they get an extra kick to reach, to, to get closer to the particle of reference. At the same time, if the particle arrives a little bit too early, it gets actually a slight, sees actually a slower, uh, a lower electric field, which means that it gets a little bit less accelerated. Okay, so practically speaking, this type of structure provides what we say longitudinal focusing. So the particles get squashed together into relatively uh, tiny bunches. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that needs to be dimensioned basically depending on the, the, the energy you want to give and how fast is your radio frequency switching. Okay, because basically the time it passes in uh, in between one and other, so the time between this part and this part needs to be basically the time it, it allows you to switch between uh, one voltage and, and the other, right? So it needs to basically continuously switch in from one voltage and the other. And that frequency determines basically also how fast they, how long they, you can need, need to make them. So does the a little bit, uh, but the, the single, yeah, a little bit here. So in fact, when you do the, the actual computation, you need to take that into account. Uh, but particle tends to be rather fast. So these tubes tend to be, I actually have to say, I was, I was about to say, they tend to be relatively long compared to the gap. That's true at the very end. At the very beginning, they're not that longer with respect to the gaps. Actually, I think I have a picture. Um, yes, uh, okay. In the next slide, I will have another picture that shows you a, a real uh, a element of that. So you can actually see in practice. So at the very beginning, they actually, the, the, the width of the tube for this type of application is sort of similar to the gap, but then it gets longer and the gap's much smaller, okay. Um, so it, it kind of um, similar, uh, concept. So when you try to push this concept further, the main thing that is going to start to be uh, really hard is that the more voltage you get, etc., the more you start having effects uh, around the non-uniform electric field, as well as some border effects in which the field inside uh, towards the edge starts not to be exactly zero and so on. So once you start pushing to higher and higher voltages, you start seeing these type of problems. So the one way to sort of overcome them and also to make things more compact is to actually enclose this system into another system. And this is what is called a cavity. And so this cavity now gets the potential and essentially the cavity is carefully designed such that the electric field enters in a sort of resonance mode so that the electric field itself uh, creates wave of uh, sinusoidal waves again of electric field that are relatively stable and transmit that, that energy to the particle that, um, that can come through. So this is basically, if you want how you see it, you see basically a kind of, uh, this is one example of um, um, even more refined uh, design where you have this sort of um, enclosure with this cavity and then you have the different tube here that are connected with external power source that get, get the potential and the beam comes through. And, and this is in fact the concept that is at the basic of what is called the linear four. So this is the first stage of acceleration of the LSC, okay? From when we start with protons uh, 
the first thing we do, we accelerate it uh, with, um, with well linear acceleration. And in fact, um, if you look at the beginning of the picture, if you pay more attention, they did this scheme of the LSE, at the very beginning, it had something that was called LINAC2 and LINAC3. It didn't have it in the LINAC4 because I grabbed a slightly older picture. LINAC4 is, is relatively, actually, is basically brand new and has been designed because to meet the needs of the aluminosity LSA. The previous LINAC was not able to provide enough protons with enough time structure to satisfy the needs for the luminosity LSA. So it was, there was a huge effort to redesign completely the linear acceleration, the initial part of the linear acceleration of the LSA. And so this is basically the LINAC for one piece of the LINAC for, and you see what, I'm, what I was uh, mentioning to you before. These are the sort of, this is the old cavity. And these are sort of the tubes that are inside. So you see the very first ones, these are relative, the, the, the size of that is not that long, it's something like this. And then there is a small gap. But then as you go, the size needs to increase. Okay, so this is one, one small piece. The overall Linux 4 works with these, these radio frequencies work at about a bit less than 400 megahertz. And uh, the length, uh, here it is, 19 meters. Okay, so that, that's basically the length of that. And it contains a total of 120 drift tubes. And then it has a few more elements, but you can see that basically from the uh, proton source, the initial accelerator, you go from like a few tenths of kV up to 160 MeV. And at that point, you transfer it to circular accelerator for the next stages of acceleration, okay? Good. Okay. Um, one concept that we, we started to see and, and it's actually very important and it's something that I've been always amazed how few people in practice uh, know about this LSE, even people who work in the experiments, is that we, we said that this because of this oscillation of electric field, we actually end, end up having this sort of um, bucket, so this um, bunch uh, set of protons. And then if you ask, okay, uh, what is the distance between uh, uh, two bunches of protons, many, most people will know that it's about 25 nanoseconds. Now, what most people don't get right is actually this is not the frequency of the radio frequency actually accelerate that is in the LAC. In fact, the frequency of that radio frequency is about a factor of 10 higher, is 400 megahertz. So that resulted basically a sinusoidal wave with a period which is actually 2.5 nanoseconds. And, uh, and the protons are confined in those 2.5 nanoseconds. Simply, we don't fill every single of these packets, but we actually fill actually one out of 10 packets, which results in the 25 nanosecond spacing between one bucket of proton and the other, okay? And, uh, and this is basically, a, is a distance of equivalent to 7.5 meters, essentially. Um, and it's um, pretty amazing how very few people end up knowing this somehow. Um, and the reason for that is, is actually all determined about uh, how to match the various frequencies of the previous stages of accelerator and then squeeze enough the bunches in a short enough bunch. Um, once squeezed into these radio frequency buckets, um, the, the, the profile of this beam, and I'll say a few words more in a second, tends to be essentially Gaussianish uh, shape. Basically, they, they, they get squeezed in, but of course, you have still a distribution which is about Gaussian in, uh, in shape. Um, yeah, that's, I think, the main thing I wanted to say on this one here. Okay. Now, we also said that then, okay, in terms of the, in addition to accelerate, we need to keep the beam uh, within the ring and that's done uh, with magnets. And so how much, uh, how strong of a magnets you need, that's fairly easy to calculate in a, in a naive way. You just have the Lorentz force. And then, so you know that for a given momentum and a given charge, so in case of proton is just the, the same electron charge, um, the, the, the momentum is basically related to the radius of curvature for a given magnetic field. Now, a very useful formula, which will come back for another purpose, but is very useful uh, uh, to remember, is that the, the, this radius of curvature, magnetic field, and momentum, when expressed in meter, tesla, and GV, 
they are related by this constant at 0 0.3. Basically, the numeric factor from the conversion comes 0 0.3. And this is actually very, very useful for a lot of conversions. So it's good if you if you can remember a factor of 0 0.3 in this relationship, that's basically the magic factor. You can easily work out how qualitatively this formula is, but this factor will make it so much easier to compute things very quickly. And so taking LEC as an example, the, the, the effective essentially curvature uh, radius is about 2.8 kilometers. And, uh, and this is because it's basically using the pre-existing tunnel that will use a lap for the plus and minus collision. And so you can try to compute and then basically what is the magnetic field that you need to keep a 70 V beam within this ring. And you need basically uh, about the eight Tesla magnetic field, which dimension what is the size of the magnets you need to have uh, to make it work. Or in some sense, the other way around, it gives you the maximum momentum you can keep in the beam if you have a, a fixed ring, which gives you the radius, and a fixed technology of magnets, which gives you the maximum magnetic field you can have, which is more often what's the way we use this. Okay. Um, so the, the, the way we bend beams, and, and here we sort of up to now, we've been talking about beams, just thinking about a single beam, is that actually at LEC, we need to have two beams of protons and they need to go in separate directions, which also means that sort of they need to, the velocity will be opposite in direction. So you need to bend them both, but so they will need a different direction of the magnetic field. And so how you do that is using with these dipole magnets. Um, and, and these are sort of create a magnetic field, which is opposite direction. And uh, the two beams are each in separate uh, lines, in separate uh, vacuum uh, beam lines that go around the ring. And so when they go through these magnets, they will basically, you will have each beam going uh, in one of these, uh, one of these um, two beam pipes. And then uh, they will experience the different magnetic field depending on the direction they have. And so practically speaking, actually these, these dipole magnets, you can see it here, they're made of very, very tiny uh, wires and uh, they, where you basically create a very high current and they work basically in, uh, uh, in, in superconducting mode. Because the current that you basically need to circulate around these magnets is uh, almost 12 uh, 1000 ampere, which is huge. So you cannot really afford any resistance. So the only way you can do it is if you have, a mat if these wires are made of material, which is superconducting, and then they are cooled down in the case of LHC to a bit less than two Kelvin. And this allows basically then to not lose energy, uh, uh, to not have any resistance with this current flowing. Um, and okay, in fact, this is the type of start, the sort of superconductor currently used and come back with in the future technology, this is coming to a limit of its maximum uh, field strength current that it can support. So we need to really change materials. Um, the other thing which is not obvious is that you will need these magnets to be long to allow them uh, to cover enough of the circumference then to, to bend. And in fact, each of these pieces is made at least 15 meters long. And probably you've seen pictures like this, but this is basically, these are the dipole magnets that we just talked about, these blue things. And here you see the two apertures. And so you see they go around the ring. They don't have the whole ring, but they, they cover most of it. And they keep the beam uh, around the LAC tunnel. Okay, um, so, one other concept that is, is useful to have when thinking about a beam going around uh, your, your, uh, your ring is about what we call synchrotron radiation. And so this is the fact that if a charged particle um, feels a, an acceleration, so a force, and uh, if you want to keep it within a circumference, you need to accelerate the particle to change it the, the, the direction of its velocity. Uh, then this charged particle will tend to radiate photons, okay? And so how, what is the, this formula gives you a little bit the power of like how much energy is radiated for a given, uh, uh, for a given velocity and a curvature radius. And one thing that is very important to note is that basically this depends to the beta gamma at the fourth power. 
Okay, so that that's a pretty large power, and uh, and the curvature, the bending radius square, and so. I mentioned to you that sort of the LAC ring used to be used for an E plus E minus collider, the, the lab collider. And then uh, um, the reason it reached sort of a limit in energy is actually due exactly to this synchrotron radiation. So the more you were accelerating these electrons, the more they were radiating power and losing energy by radiation. And at some point you put so much energy in and most of it gets wasted in radiation, which is also harmful for a lot of the electronics that is around and you reach sort of a limit. So to go beyond that limit, either um, you can you only, you can basically, you need to build uh, a bigger tunnel. And so switching to uh, protons or for instance, muons, that gives you a huge advantage because for the same momentum, of course, the mass is different. The mu mass is about 200 times of electron. The proton mass is almost 200, 2000 times the electrons, which means for the same momentum, their velocity will be lower. And given that this power scales as the four time of beta gamma, practically speaking, this, this power scales at the four power of the mass or the inverse four power of the mass. So what it was a problem in that tunnel for electron becomes essentially a factor of 200 at the fourth less of a problem for muons and a factor 2000 to the fourth less of a problem for protons. So in fact, this is actually not a problem at all for protons at LAC. The, their mass is so large that this, this synchrotron radiation becomes um, rather small. Although it's still used and actually there are um, very interesting detector plates around the LAC that can also detect some of these radiations. And yeah, for a plus manual collider, though, this, this type of radiation becomes really the limiting factor. Um, okay, so now we have accelerator beam. Um, we know how to keep it in a ring, and now we need to get to collide those beams. And at the beginning, I showed you how the luminosity was inversely proportional to the size of the beam, just as if you think as probability of proton colliding. So when you get towards the collision, you actually want to have your beam focused. And throughout the ring, you just don't want your group of, of protons or, or your beam to become, to basically deviate and just go on a tangent and get out of the beam pipe and, uh, and lose the beam. So how do you keep your beam inside the beam pipe in the transverse plane? So you've seen that the radio frequency already squeezed the beam in the longitudinal direction, the direction of motion. So, but how do we keep it uh, well contained in the transverse direction. And this is done using quadrupoles. Basically a quadrupole is, is depicted here. And then if you work out essentially the direction, the magnetic field that this provides and the forces of a charged particle going through, what I, the quadrupole has the property that will create two forces that sort of squeeze the beam in one direction. And they try to sort of essentially will, a particle that goes a little bit off center will be brought back towards the center which is great, which is what we want. But unfortunately have also the property that a particle in this other direction that is a bit of center is actually pushed further away. So they defocus the beam in the other direction. Um, so this is a lot, it, it basically works a lot like a converging lens in one direction and a diverging one in the other direction. So how does this help? Um, well, the way it's done is essentially put a series of these quadruples of lenses throughout that continuously focus and defocus the beam. So the beam is not kept as a static single size beam throughout the whole ring, but the, the whole beam basically keeps expanding and contracting in each direction as it travels through the LSC. Okay. And so you basically, you keep focusing and then defocusing the beam in, in each direction. And in this way, you can basically keep the, the beam within some envelope uh, and that is well within your beam pipe uh, throughout the, the LSC tunnel. So this only works is the focal distance. Uh, okay, it, it, there is of course, you need to have a focal distance that is greater than the distance between elements. And more practically, what you end up usually, you, you, you might hear this term FODO, FODO, which is basically the basic element of these accelerators where you focus, then accelerate a bit, defocus and drift again. Uh, and so this element sort of is the basic cell that then is repeat uh, all around. 
there is a lot more on this dynamic. And in fact, in LEC, you will find us not only dipoles that bend the beam, quadrupoles that focus and defocus, but you will see other multiples like sextuples and octopoles that need to be, are there to basically correct higher order moments of the beam and make sure it doesn't uh, lose quality. Yes. Yesterday, all those, uh, the focusing on the Yeah. Well, you, what you were, what the goal of the photo is, you don't. The goal of the photo is, is that you don't end up without a beam, because if you have nothing, uh, your, you know, in your ideal world, you will have some velocity which is the, is along the trajectory, and you will have nothing transverse. Nothing is never a great concept experimentally. There will be some tiny bit. So if you do nothing, that tiny bit sooner or later will have your proton drifting away. So that's why you need this dynamic thing to basically keep it within an envelope, okay? And, uh, and the more it's outside the center, the stronger is the focus back. So it will not make it more focus. It will just keep it within the envelope, okay? In both direction. Yeah, excellent question. But at some point, you want to make it more focused. Um, and we'll see in a second where. So I wanted to introduce just one extra concept that you might see sometimes, and I find it extremely interesting. So we've seen that as we go around the beam, around the, the collider, um, the beam is really not is, is following a circumference, is kind of oscillating around in these trajectories, okay? And this you can solve what is the trajectory you expect, and basically as it goes around, as depicted here, it basically has this oscillating trajectory. And there is one particular uh, aspect of this which comes out, uh, experimentally speaking, uh, often as soon as you have to uh, have to deal with anything that is close to LHC beam, which is this beta function. And this beta function, in particular beta star, is basically describing the size, if you want, of that beam as it goes around, and in particular close to interaction point. So for, for you, for the one of you that are more on the maybe Atlas CCM experiment, you might even have heard about, oh, we are making a, a special run, which is a low beta star run. What is that? That beta star is exactly essentially the, the time it takes in quote, uh, the time it takes for the beam to increase the size by some amount. Okay, and so that beta star lower or, or higher is basically telling you know, how strong the beam is bouncing back from the focusing to the defocusing part. Okay, and so and and so this basically is related to the size of the beam, which is the, some sort of uh, nominal size, and then you have a factor that depends on this beta star, and s is sort of the distance from the minimum that you have. Okay. So the fact beta star is, is usually measured in meters. And as you can think about the distance from the collision point in meters. And so how, uh, how big the, the, the beam can become and how, how long it takes to become on, on its maximum size from the minimum. OK, so the, um, when we get to the interaction region, now is the time to not only keep the beam um, inside the ring, but now is the time to focus it to the smallest possible time. So there, in fact, we have a different set of magnets. So this is just uh, uh, to give you an idea that sort of nearby the interaction region. So this is sort of in meters. This is a nominal interaction region. So close to 200 meters, close to interaction region, we start changing a lot of the type of magnets that we have inside. And so here we have a set of quadrupoles and dipoles magnets. These are arranged exactly to squeeze the beam as much as possible. Now, what that means is also that the more you squeeze, the more they will have to bounce back. So on the other side, you need another set of magnet, or if you want it here, to catch it and basically making sure it doesn't, uh, it doesn't go out. Um, and in fact, it, often people talk about the dipole magnets to keep LSE around as very high strength. And it's true there were a challenge because there are very, very many. But the highest strength magnets are actually near the interaction region to focus the beam to the smallest possible size. And in fact, here, um, now the, the, we used, up to now, we use the same type of magnets. And the peak field of those uh, compared to the eight Tesla of the dipole is actually more than 11 Tesla. 
Okay, so those are the strongest magnet we actually do for LEC. And in fact, for high lumi LEC, yes, sorry. Uh, Minor, you guess the cross-sectional area of the doesn't change. You know, you get from the other yes. Is that true? And if that is true, how does having the higher order magnets change that? So the higher order magnets from quadruple, like sextuples and octuples, they don't change that. What they try to um, so like in some sense, if you think, let me, let me see. Yeah. If it, the way they act to the beam is not, is basically on the distribution inside. You do not, you don't only need to worry about the beam as an envelope. You also want to worry about how the protons are distributed inside. And if you don't do anything because of like small, uh, imperfections and so on, you will start having something that instead of a nicely Gaussian shape, it starts developing sort of extra small blobs on one side, et cetera, that ultimately can give you problems. So those sextuple and octuples are done to reshape the structure of the beam inside and to keep it basically as nice as possible. Once you get here, now it's the time that you basically need to focus in, in, a, very, in a very big way. But again, you basically, and there is, in fact, the magnets are done in a bit different way. They're not simple, just quadruple, as I was saying. They're rotating, a, they're, made, they're put in a different way to just focus the beam very strongly, and then that will bounce back. Is though. There some special it's a very different, different yes, correct. So it's very yeah. different from the photo type of thing that we have around. The photo cell that has around that just conserves the, the overall volume, if you want. Uh, but this one basically squeezes over. Um, but the price is that then it bounces back uh, very heavily. Um, and in fact, you, you might have heard about this niobium three thin uh, superconductors. And this is sort of the, the, the type of superconductor that has been looked, that we'll be using uh, for a luminosity LAC in the interaction region to focus the beams even more than what we can do now. And that gives us the highest, the higher luminosity. But also when thinking about future accelerator, that is the, the technology that we'll need to have if we want to have more powerful magnets that allow us to keep a higher energy in a, in a, in a given ring. So if it, this is sort of, um, um, it's showing you a little bit how uh, strong, but also painfully slow is the R&D and uh, the, the, the quest of having stronger and stronger magnets. It gives you versus here, here is 1975, that's 2020. Basically the strength of the magnet that we're using various accelerators from the SPS at CERN to Tevatron, Herod, uh, Rick and so on, LSC here. And then Ilum LSC will have actually to pass that threshold. We're talking about 11 Tesla. So we'll have to go above this line where uh, really this niobium treating uh, superconductor material is needed to get to those strengths. Uh, are those uh, No, they, they are new, new. Yeah, I would say they are a new invention where new is probably, I don't know, 30 years old. Uh, it just takes a very long time from a proof of principle of having, semiconductor, having a superconductor that can sustain that to actually fabricate a huge magnet that needs to have not only the, the, the power, but also you need to pass through the beam. And so in fact, we can reach much higher magnetic fields in, actually, in some magnet test magnets. The problem is that usually they do it in a very tiny aperture. So you have a very small aperture in, in between where you can reach even higher magnetic fields, but that's not big enough for the beam to pass through. So you need to have magnets that are large enough for your beam to pass through, especially in this phase of like focusing and then catching up the focus. Uh, so that that aperture requirement is actually a huge driving factor in what what manages to to to, to achieve, what we manage to achieve as field strength. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know, I want to... So no, no, it makes sense. So a beta star essentially govern how, in, in some sense, how quickly, the, so how much you focus the beam, but also how quickly it rebounds back. So it's sort of is your time or distance constants that govern how much the size increases versus time or versus distance from the interaction point. So. Um, Basically, this, this I think is the most intuitive. So this one is the size of the beam at some given point S. And let's say S0 is your collision point. So that S0, you basically, your size is sigma star. You're, that's the interaction point size that we know. Now, if I'm, I have a beta star of like 10 meters, okay? Now, basically, if I move away the 10 meters, then now this size increases by a square root of two. Okay, so that basically governs that. Um, if you have, usually basically the, um, the, how well, so you want to have uh, the beam such that it doesn't really defocus too much um, within the interaction point. The beam has a finite size, so you want it to sort of be nicely around the interaction point and you don't want, and then how far you can uh, um, defocus depends also on where you have the magnet. So depending on the magnet configuration, you can tweak how much beta star is but to be able to catch the beam. Um, let me see, there is, um, so there are some implications of like how beta star is in terms of also, in terms of both luminosity, and actually this one I haven't touched in the in terms of the fact that actually the beams don't um, interact head on, but what for, for various reasons, um, what we end up doing is actually tilting slightly the beams next to the collision, okay? And so that cross section also, um, that angle also plays a role in how the luminosity is determined. And so playing with that angle and beta star is something that the accelerator people use to maintain stability of the beam avoiding too many interactions. So because the, even the amount of interactions you have as sort of helps keeping the, um, help keeps in the beam, um, how can I say, um, stable. So maybe I can show you one thing to, to make it more clear. What happens if I try to squeeze the beam too much? Okay, I really squeeze the beam as much as I can, the, the best I can do. And so what happens is that one beam is arriving, okay, really squeezed, and then it then it bounces back, okay? And so we have one beam in one direction, and then we'll have the other beam in the other direction, okay? So one here and one here. Now, if my beta star increases, this basically size increases, okay? And now if, if I squeeze that too much and beta star becomes large, now the probability of the protons after the, le the left interaction to find some other protons and interact becomes higher and higher. In fact, we actually already do have some collision from residual protons in the beam that, are, that happen away from the interaction point after the other beam passes through. And some of these we actually can see in our detectors as well. They're called satellite collisions. Um, if that increases too much, that will destabilize the beam and you lose the beam. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of delicate balance. Okay, and so we talked about the, the luminous region. And so the, this is sort of, um, the, the, the sort of, you have to know numbers about how does it look our interaction region. So if you look at the distribution of proton-proton collisions, at the, an Atlas or CMS, uh, for instance, uh, interaction point, this is, the beam is about Gaussianly distributed in all four dimensions. So it actually has a very small transverse size. So the sigma of that Gaussian in the transverse side is about 10 microns, but it's very long. So longitudinally size uh, is about Nowadays, more towards 30, 35 millimeters, actually. More towards the beginning of the LEC was more closer to 50. Um, but that also changes depending on, for instance, beta star as well, um, on the, the LEC configuration. And then it's also 
uh, the collision region, the, 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 the distribution of collision is spread in time. And so the sigma of that spread is about 180 picoseconds. This used to be essentially negligible for any practical application, but we'll see actually nowadays it's becoming quite relevant because we'll try, we're trying to put detectors that can resolve collision within this time frame uh, for the luminosity LSC. And we we'll see how that works. And so when you see these type of pictures showing the collision point, you, every of these yellow dots represent a proto-proto collision reconstructed. All these green lines are all the charged particles. And you usually see it as a line, just because again, this dimension here, we're talking about millimeters and here we are talking in the transverse size, so perpendicular to here, um, about 10 micrometers, okay? Uh, so that, that's basically uh, an image of the beam. And yeah, okay. And in fact, actually there is one of the, um, I would say one of the most cool detectors that we have around, uh, LECB had the brilliant idea to install a detector that can actually inject a tiny bit of gas into the beam pipe. And this basically allow when the beam passes, interacts with this gas, and then it can detect the product of these interactions. And so what that allows LSCB to do in those specific cases, when it's allowed to inject gas, which is not in normal running, but in specific runs, this gas can be used to essentially image the beam and uh, measure exactly what is the distribution of the protons in each of the beams, okay? And we'll see in a second why this is actually crucial uh, to know very accurately, much better than, uh, let's say, the LSC diagnostic uh, instruments can tell us. Yes? Beam crossing and microradians. Micro, radians. Mi micro milli radians. Yeah, it's it's relatively tiny, but um, yeah, but can but helps a lot basically the, the LSC, and um, yes, and and yeah, it's uh, so the le the level of magnitude. Um, what I wanted to say, oh yeah, why this is important. Um, this actually turned out to be a, a crucial element to do one to image those beam to to measure. Um, to measure the luminosity of the of the, um, the of the collisions that LSC was delivering, and I wanted to to tell you a little bit more about this. But first, I, I first again we are talking about now the collision region, and we are talking about finally this proton colliding. Now it's time to talk about the the initial statement, which is when these two branch, bunches uh, cross. Um, not all the protons interact, actually very few of those protons interact, if at all. And so we can actually com compute how many protons tend to interact, in, on average interact for given two bunches that cross, okay? And that given the formula I gave you already is actually pretty easy. Once you know the instantaneous yeah. luminosity, you need to know what is the cross section for an inelastic proton-proton collision. That's at the level about 80 millibar. And then given the number of bunches and, uh, and frequency, because the time goes away, um, you basically see that for typical for a typical luminosity of 10 to the 34, you have about 50 interaction per bunch crossing. Now, practically it's not a fixed number, depending on the LC machine uh, uh, set up these changes with time. And that's why you see these type of plots from the LC, which shows the mean number of interactions per two bunch crossing. Um, as a function of the time of the data set that we have. So the, this different data set. And of course, the higher the luminosity, which is good to get uh, access more rare events, uh, the higher also the, uh, the, the, the amount of interactions per bunch crossing. And nowadays we are basically running with an average, which is even above 50 interaction per bunch crossing. Um, when going from here to Illuminous LHC, the, the, the large increase in luminosity, which will go up to, we see in a second, up to the 5, 10 to the 34, or even 7.5, 10 to the 34, will result to an interaction, number of interaction per bunch crossing about 140 or 200 in the ultimate scenario. And then the these collisions, as far as we know, with, with, an, with this one star, when asterisk will come to, they basically happen at the same time. So then it's, it's the job to the experiment to disentangle what uh, what products come from each of these interactions. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, so, yeah, very good. So once I have uh, two bunches with a specific set of properties, and uh, so, right, some number of bunches, some given instantaneous luminosity of those bunches, okay? I have some average number of interaction, mu, uh, let's say 50. Now, the number of interactions that happen in that band crossing is a Poisson distribution with an average, which is that 50. As we run the LAC settings, optics, and SWOT changes, the size of the beam keeps changing. That changes the luminosity, and that changes the average number you expect per bunch crossing. And that's the distribution you see here, how much the mean of that Poisson changes versus time. You see the difference? So once I fix the time, I have two bunch crossing that has a, a specific mu, and then the number of interactions of Poisson from that mu. But then as time goes, the, the property of the beam changes and so on, so that mu changes. And so this is the distribution how mu changed versus time in all 2011, 12, 15, 18, 22, 23 that they're taking. Good. Um, now, you might wonder why here you have such a wide distribution. And then I tell you, high lumen is C, 140, 200. That's it, just a number. Okay, and I don't show you any distribution. Um, there is actually a very good reason for that. Um, and, uh, and, and to do to, to, to explain you that, I need to introduce the concept of luminosity leveling. So the experiments um, are designed to sustain a maximum number of interactions happening in the same bunch crossing that are able to disentangle. Okay, and we used to be to say just really see, just go as high as you can, we we'll just make it happen and just give us the highest luminosity possible. Well, they took us pretty seriously and going to the ILUM LSC, we actually will not be able to sustain the highest luminosity possible they can give us. But in fact, the way we will run is actually slightly reducing their maximum luminosity. And so how do you reduce the luminosity? LSC has different knobs to tune how much luminosity they beam produced. One is the called beta star leavening. Now we know what is beta star. You're basically changing essentially the, how the cross-section of the beam evolves. And that gives you a, essentially a different cross-section of the beam interacting and changing the size, changing the luminosity. The other one is just separating the beam. Instead of colliding almost head on, I can make them collide slightly offset. And at that point, my collision, which are just the convolution of the two Gaussian distribution of protons, will become slightly off center, so will be reduced. And that's so-called beam separation uh, for luminosity leveling. In fact, even nowadays, address in CMS and for instance, LACB see different type of luminosity. LACB has a luminosity which is much lower because the experiment needs a much lower luminosity to, to be able to disentangle the physics they want. And uh, nowadays, a beta star level is what is used to give LACB as much lower luminosity, but you can separate beams as well. Um, and in fact, um, this is basically just to give you a more concrete example. Right now, the profile of the instantaneous luminosity that, that we observed at some interaction point basically is reduced versus time. So at the beginning, you have a very nice quality beam. You have very high luminosity. As the time goes on, some proton gets still lost. The beam, you cannot squeeze it anymore as good as you would like. So as hours pass by, the actual luminosity goes down. Okay, um, so this is basically for the LSC is this gray and, and uh, yeah, the gray one, I think is the LSC, yeah, run two, uh, which is much higher than the nominal and goes down. For the ILUM LSC, this is sort of, we could get as high as here. Okay, so it's basically more than 10 to the 35 centimeter, inverse centimeter square, inverse second. Um, and that would basically decrease very rapidly then. Instead, what we do, we will basically level the luminosity, and that allows us actually to keep the beam a little bit more stable because we don't have to squeeze as much. And then basically we level such that we continuously change that leveling such that throughout the time, the actual instantaneous luminosity stays constant up to the point that we need to, to decrease it. And so that will basically give us a way more constant instantaneous luminosity versus time, which is why I was telling you the average number of interaction per crossing will actually be 140 or 200. It will still be a distribution, 
but much, much narrower with time because the reality capacity of the accelerator is much higher and we will just be running at a, a basically artificially lower luminosity. Um, yeah, this is basically again an example. So what, what we're gonna happen instead of having short fields and then down the beam, we'll have a little bit longer fields uh, longer injection of, of protons that we run for a bunch of the same luminosity. And then we toss away the remaining proton when the beam quality is not good enough. And then we charge again the LSC. So just to clarify, yeah. uh, we will degrade anyway, as as you know. Yeah, so I readjust, correct. I readjust dynamically how much, let's, let's take the separation just as easier to think. I have a very high possible luminosity head on. I will displace them and keep monitoring. And as the quality of the beam degrades, I'll get them more and more head on. So to keep the luminosity oh, constant. Yeah. yeah, basically the same way those magnets sort of go, tell me where the trajectory will be. I can fine tune to actually be more or less head on. Um, fun fact, um, LEC has only limited amount of information about what happens at the very end part. And in fact, they rely on information that the experiments send back from their control room to the LHC control room to know how well these beams are being focused and how much luminosity is being delivered, which if for any reason your experiment is miscalibrated in measuring them, you're sending wrong information. And this had happened in the past where we always look, for instance, from address and CMS to have a similar level of luminosity delivered. And we had a situation where one of the two experiments miscalibrated their measurement of luminosity. And we thought we were getting the same luminosity, but one of the two was getting more than the other. And only once we figured out the, the wrong calibration, we actually saw that effect. And these things happen actually from time to time. Correct. We can only do in very specific cases, like with that smog detector, but very, very specific, yeah, it's very destructive. We do it only when sort of, we want to make that measurement for specific runs, okay? And in fact, it's basically, and I think I'm coming to that in the next slide, is like, how do I measure this type of luminosity? Uh, and uh, um, okay, yeah, this is only to say, probably you've seen this, as going into high luminous since I, I mentioned the high instantaneous luminosity, this is sort of the profile of the instantaneous luminosity we expect throughout the years in the high luminosity LSC running. And this is a profile of the integrated luminosity that we expect to collect throughout. Um, from experience, take this with a grain of salt. If I have to give this lecture next year, it will look different. In three years, it will still look different. Basically, the, the point is that one is try to maximize this as we go, but uh, what is achievable and what is not will only become clear the more we get closer to the aluminosity, let's say. Okay, so um, I want to do one quick thing and then uh, actually, we should probably take a, a, a couple of minutes now. I think it's, it's been a, a bit more than an hour. Maybe let's get a few minutes break and then I'll uh, I'll resume just here. We can do five minutes and, and then I can start off. Okay. We should, if you can take a seat, we, we'll get started. Okay. Okay, so here I will keep it uh, rather brief because I wanted by now to switch more on the detector, but um, I wanted also to mention very quickly, since we talked about luminosity quite a bit, is how do we measure this luminosity? And, and in fact, the way we, we I, I showed you this formula before, and that's actually roughly speaking, how we calibrate our measurement of luminosity. We measure our luminosity, during uh, using the various experiments, using a variety of methods and a variety of detectors. But the whole point that each detector, we have a response that you want to relate to how many collisions happen. And then that response has sort of give you an arbitrary scale that you hope that you want to be linear with, with the number of interactions and therefore with the luminosity. But you still need to calibrate this absolute scale into sort of 
how many interaction actually happen given some activity in a detector. And that's what is done using this so-called Vandermeer scan based on the person who sort of came up with this idea first in which we use the same concept in which we basically um, move the beam around. And so having moving them around, it will give you, it will alter the number of interactions they have. And so this gives you a number of, a number, some detector response as a function of the separation of the beam. So the LEC will just collide those beams, stay there for a bit, then move them a little bit, collide, move, collide, move. And then with that scan, we can basically know this, this sort of shape of the beam, uh, the effective size of the beam, which is basically what allows us to uh, figure out the size of the beam they go below. And then the number of protons that LSC is what actually LSC can measure pretty well. So based on that, we can essentially do an absolute measurement of the luminosity. Now, in practice, this is actually much more complicated. It's a very complex measurement. And this is just a, a list of the main systematic uncertainty that go in a luminosity measurement, which is huge. And it ranges from our detector response, the LSC calibration, and so on. It's a really huge effort. And uh, here I just wanted to mention that actually for the first time, um, we managed to measure this luminosity to less to better than 1%. And the fact that we managed to do that is actually was a pretty big achievement. And uh, but it's something where not only this calibration enters in terms of uncertainty, but actually the dominant uncertainty is how stable our detector response that we use to relate to luminosity are with time and with respect to uh, the dedicated sort of run we use, fill we use uh, to measure this absolute calibration and the normal uh, injection of protons that we use to run LSA. Yes, any uh, question? Mm -hmm. Yes, so you can see a, 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 a quite a few things. One of them is this background subtraction with increasing pileup. We, it, it is less easy to disentangle in the detector response. And so that had a higher uncertainty in the background subtraction. And then if I remember well, okay, this one is actually not too bad. Um, yeah, this one will take us way too far. There are basically specific effect on how these calibration runs were done. And you see this, this some, some particular ones like this magnetic non-reality, which is essentially relates us here. You see, I have a separation of the beam. How do I know that the LEC is separated by 250 microns? And what if they did? by more or less, they, they try to separate by 250. How well do I know that number? And so that also needs to be calibrated very well. And so that's one of the uncertainty. And in one of the years is more complicated to, it's actually we have a higher uncertainty. So that's one example of why some years might have higher uncertainty than others, regardless of the conditions. Um, oh, yeah. Combine is basically when you, you estimate year by year, you correlate all the uncertainty and then you sum them up. And so the combined is, is the one that goes below 1%, but you can see that some of them do, do not go below 1%. You can gain because some of them are uncorrelated. If all were 100% correlated, of course, you will not, but uh, that, that's how you gain it. Okay, and in fact, as I say, the, 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 the stability versus time and extrapolating to nominal condition are actually things that are on the experiment to figure out and are among the main sources of, of uncertainty. And for people at the LEC, um, I actually did work on luminosity measurement myself when I was starting on Atlas. I found it one of the most rewarding things because you end up interacting with all the experiments with the LEC people in the machine. It's a lot of fun. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So. When going to high luminosity LEC, let me say, yeah, um, we actually need to maintain this luminosity below 1%. This is because we'll have a lot more luminosity and we have measurements like Higgs properties and so on, which will be at the level of percent. So if we have an uncertainty much larger, that will dominate all our precision measurements. Um, there has been a lot of work to ensure that we can do that. And in fact, to be able to do that, we are actually installing 
different type of detectors for LUMLSU that we expect to have better response to measure luminosity. And we are also making sure that some of the detectors we are installing can be used much better than, can, than are used now to actually measure luminosity. So in designing the detector, we kept an eye on sort of, does that work for measuring luminosity? What are the manifests that was, were difficult to keep under control? How can we make it better? So that's the goal, is a non-trivial goal to keep that 1%, um, because essentially the, these calibrations happen with very few protons in the machine. The luminosity is much lower, and then you extrapolate to a much higher luminosity. And then the ILUMI, the extrapolation becomes even larger. And this extrapolation already is one of the dominant effects. Once we increase it by order by a factor of five, would completely dominate the uncertainty and, and explode. So we have to do something to make sure that that uncertainty goes down. And, and that's what we're working on. So it's both our detector technology methods and so on, what we've learned so far. Okay, good. Um, look, I will probably skip this for sake of time. I wanted to tell you a few, uh, few just words about how uh, we go beyond high uh, if we want to make a bigger collider, but let, let, let's skip that. Um, in case you ask me later, I, we can go to that. And instead, in the, in the last a little bit before we, we end today, I wanted to start introducing a little bit the detectors and event reconstruction. Um, and so, we have now collisions, and uh, but how do we detect the uh, the outcome of this proton-proton collision? And uh, it, the, practically speaking, we come back to the electromagnetic weak and strong interactions. And in particular, um, different type of particles will interact differently. Charged particles, for instance, we can detect them through ionization. Photons, we can detect them through pair production in material for imbine ionization, neutral. Uh, leptons, we can, for instance, neutrino, they, they, they might, they basically, we, um, we can detect the absence of them from imbalance of energy, for instance. Um, hadrons, we can detect them through the strong interaction when they hit a nucleus and, and, uh, and, uh, and create decay products. Um, Yes, and other fundamental particles usually have a very short lifetime and they decay into one of these uh, category of particles uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then what we want to know is actually measure the kinematic property of these particles. So measuring the energy, the momentum. And so we, and we use again different technology to measure these different quantity. Usually the energy is given by sort of the, the, the stopping power and we'll see in a second how. Uh, of a particle, for instance, in a calorimeter, the momentum of charged particle is, is measured by dedicated detectors in magnetic field and so on. Um, so practically speaking, you, you've seen often this picture and basically what I want to do next is basically give you an idea of what technologies allow us basically to, to create something like this. So this is showing a cross section of different type of detectors that we try to stack on, on top of each other to measure what type of particle produced and what was their kinematic properties. And this is sort of the best way we found to stack them together. If you have better ways, you should, you should write about this because that's by far, for sure, not the only way to do it. And again, thinking about the future, I'm pretty sure we will see different, uh, different, different um, arrangements as well. But in this pretty classical arrangement, you have an interaction point and you have the first part is a so-called tracking detector, which um, detects charged particles with minimal interaction. Then you have an electromagnetic calorimeter, which tries to stop particles that, uh, like electron and photon, that decay predominant, that interact very heavily with through the electromagnetic force. And then for things that are like not uh, for for things that are sort of more hadrons. Um, they will deposit energy here, but also they will, they will manage to go through the electromagnetic calorimeter. It's not enough material to stop them. And so we have something even heavier that tries to stop and measure their energy. And then muons, we'll see in a second why, they tend to go through all this material and they will be detected outside. So what you're gonna do then is put together this information. So you see something, a particle down here, a particle down here, you know that it's a muon very likely. You see a charged particle here and activity in this electromagnetic calorimeter, you know it's an electron. 
But if you see this electromagnetic activity in the, in the calorimeter, but no charged particle, that's more likely a photon. So you're basically combining this information together to figure out what type of particle um, is produced. And as we'll see, measure its kinematic properties. Okay, so in practice, to do that is a little bit more complicated than that cartoon. You need to fit everything uh, together and you need to be as hermetic as possible. So this is an example with the Atlas, um, which you can see again, the inner tracking in the innermost region surrounded by the calorimeters. And this muon part, which was very tiny in that figure is actually a huge part of the detector in volume, which basically surrounds the outer calorimeter. And this gives you the scale, which probably you've seen before. It's about 25 meters in diameter here, length about 45 meters. Um, and in reality, it's even more messy, of course, because these things are, need to take data outside. You need to have power. You need to have cooling. So you have a lot of different cables going around. And, uh, and this gives you a little bit of a better feeling how this uh, a detector like that looks in practice. So um, in all of these, these experiments at LHC need to sustain, needs to be able to detect the products of this collision, but needs to sustain high interaction rate. We talked about every 25 nanoseconds, um, large particle multiplicity produced and uh, be able to build complex observables out of the single particle that are detected. And they also need to have stringent requirements in terms of both rate capability, the high detection efficiency, and so on and so forth. And work, of course, in very high radiation environment because a lot of this collision means also a lot of radiation and that can impact significantly, for instance, the electronics. But just to give you an idea, often um, space exploration is, is used as an example throughout as um, electronic that needs to work in radiation environment because there is not the protection of the atmosphere. Um, the electronic we need to design for LHC is more than an order of magnitude, way more radiation hard than there needs to be to go in space. In fact, this basically, that's why we need to a lot of custom electronic because it's a little bit of a very unique uh, environment. Um, more recently, um, fusion reactor, they've been interested in similar technologies. Anyway, um, I also wanted to mention briefly, but uh, again, I will mention throughout the slides a little bit that um, both Atlas CMS will undergo very heavily upgrade uh, going toward the high luminosity LHC. This is just to give an idea of the uh, amount of different things we're gonna change. In the Atlas, we're gonna replace the electronic in the immune system. We're gonna completely replace the inner tracker. Toss away what we have now, replaces with a new one. Um, upgrade the trigger, all the readout electronics, also the calorimeter. We're going to install new detectors that are very uh, precise timing detector with a resolution of 30 picoseconds. If you remember the Gaussian distribution of this PP interaction was had a, um, a sigma of about 180 picoseconds. So this allows to distinguish when within the luminous region interactions have happened and additional up, uh, small upgrades, but luminosity detector to reach the precision that we needed. And CMS is gonna do a very similar thing in which is basically replacing a lot, all the tracker is installing timing detectors, um, replacing completely the trigger uh, and data acquisition system as well. And also installing a new NCAP calorimeter, which I'll, I'll mention through the slide because it's a really nice piece of technology that they are developing. Okay, but so let me start sort of in, in, in the quest of sort of how do we detect this particle? Let me start with charged particles. And the reason for that is because reconstructing charged particle, as we will see later, is actually one of the um, tasks that takes the most CPU time when we run these algorithms. Um, this is an example of the CPU time that it takes to reconstruct an event, how it is divided by various things. The blue, and the brown is basically reconstructing charged particle in the innermost part of our detector. And then you have the rest. You have muon tracking, which is also charged particle reconstruction, and everything else is basically 21% of the time. So it's a pretty heavy task, and there is a reason for that. We need to basically determine exactly how many electrically charged particles will produce and measure their trajectory. And the way we do is to put 
uh, a, a set of layers that interact with charge particle minimally and gives us ideas of where charge particle pass through, so having points. And then we place this detector in uniform magnetic field so that in this plane, the, the trajectory will be a circle. And then we design algorithm to find these trajectories. And so the way we start is to have this detector that measure the interaction of this charged particle. And this will be, I will give you a little bit of an idea of uh, how these are made and a bit of an history of this tracking detector. Um, in fact, all the, most of the tracking detectors we designed so far, including the ones we're using LAC, are based on one phenomena, which is ionizations. Um, this, this goes from very simple, very, very, uh, the first chambers, bubble chambers that sort of are here, all the way to modern silicon detectors. They're all based basically on ionization. Um, yeah, let me just skip this. So what is, so the, the, when a charged particle goes through material, it interacts with the electrons of the material. And, uh, and, and it does that through the Coulomb force, nothing, nothing more than that. And so when going through and interacting with this atom, it will scatter around and will actually interact in an inelastic way and losing energy. And the amount of energy it loses per unit length that it goes through, it depends on the charge of the particle squared. It depends on the properties of the material. This is E and A, atomic and mass number of the material. It depends on the velocity um, and, and, uh, and, and yeah, material specific um, constants. Uh, this is what is known as the Batten block formula. Um, it's an approximate formula. It's, it's not an exact formula, but it describes pretty well the energy loss unit length for the energy, we care, the energy range we care about. Um, in fact, one thing that actually we need to be very careful and is often confused about it, confused and we need to be a little bit careful, is that we can define actually two different quantities. One is the so-called mass stopping power, which is the average energy loss in some material. And one is the linear stopping power, which is just the density of the material times this. And these are used, you can distinguish them very quickly, uh, just looking at the units that they are measured in. And simply one basically is, is taking is basically um, taking the density of the material off of the calculation and one is including it. And for various reasons, one is more convenient to use than the other, um, depending on the situation. One is more convenient or, or the other, depending on the situation. But you can easily um, figure it out from the units. So if you see a unit that has grams at the minus one here, you know that you basically, to compute the actual energy, you will have to include the density of the material, okay? That's the, the bottom line. And in practice, this is how it looks like, um, this Batten block. Um, this is more of a experimental derivation of that. Um, but you can see this is a function of the beta gamma of the particle. Now, for, um, for LAC energies, really what, what we care about mostly is from around beta gamma, let's say 0.1 onwards, okay, up to here. So here you see two, a, a three different regimes. The first one, you see this decrease. This goes as one over beta square, so with the velocity. So the, 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 more, the, the higher the speed of the particle, the lower is the energy that you lose per unit length for the, the same material, okay? Then you get to a minimum. This broad minimum is often called the minimum ionizing, uh, the minimum ionization minimum. And a particle with that beta gamma is often called a minimum ionizing particle. And that minimum is actually pretty broad, okay? This rise here is quite exaggerated. Up to, in all this range up to a beta gamma of a thousand, um, this is actually pretty, uh, is pretty constant. So a particle in all this range is called a minimum ionizing particle often, even if it is a bit far from the minimum. And the energy loss per unit length is roughly constant. So practically speaking, if you see the second axis, it gives you an idea given for a momentum, for a muon. Um, for a muon of one GV, we are talking about a beta gamma that is around already 10. So we are already in the minimum ionizing particle and you can have 100, uh, 10, 100 GV uh, up to TV. We're still around here. Up to here, you start having, entering the, this final regime where you start having extra radiation uh, due to photons being emitted and so a, a higher energy loss, 
So practically speaking, most of the particles producing proton-proton electricity -proton collisions and reconstructing our detector will be in this regime here of minimum ionizing particle, which means they will deposit roughly the same amount of charge per unit length, regardless the momentum be slightly higher, lower, type of particle, a bit different, a pion, a kaon, it will roughly deposit a similar amount of energy, okay? Um, okay, here is just, this, this energy loss depends on material, and the way it depends on the material, there are a lot of sort of um, empirical formulas, and it's tabulated very, very well uh, for most of the uh, range of interest. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time. What is important instead is that what I gave you is basically that what that formula gives you is the average energy loss. Um, microscopically, if you think about a particle going through, on average, you will interact with some amount of atoms, but practically speaking, especially when the material becomes uh, thinner, but the number of atoms that it will interact might change time to time. Again, most of the material is made of empty space. So practically you have fluctuation on how much energy a particle loses. That fluctuation is, it is empirically described by a function called a Landau function, um, which is a sort of a kind of, if you see a kind of Gaussian-like, but with very, very long tail toward very high energy losses, okay? So when that, what that formula gives you is the average of that, uh, but then, for every particle that goes through, actually the spread of how much energy is lost uh, can change quite a lot. Um, yes, okay. Um, as these charged particles go through the material, sometimes can have even a, a secondary effects where it might head uh, towards some electron very head on, and it may even dislodge an electron that exists in an atom, and that electron can have enough kinetic energy to start ionizing itself, the material. And that's what is normally called delta rays. And practically speaking, if you had a sampling of energy loss throughout the trajectory, you might see at some point uh, another electron very spinning off and ionizing in a, in a trajectory, basically, that spins off from the initial charge particle. And, and these effects, we, we observe them and we need to take them into account usually. Um, okay, so we, we design tens, if not hundreds of type of tracking detector, detector for charged particle that uses ionization as principle. One of the most um, historical ones, one of the first ones that were designed were this sort of emulsion detector. So practically speaking, um, here you see the reaction, but it's essentially a type of silver reduction and you basically end up having um, some crystal form when I, the energy lost by ionization uh, makes a reaction happen that cre in that case was creating a silver crystal that you could uh, later on look at a microscope. So you will create this emulsion and, uh, and essentially the passage through of the particle was releasing enough energy to create a visible uh, set of crystal along the trajectory. Um, this was great and uh, absolutely very useful at that time. Um, incredibly speaking, for many reasons, we actually still use some of these detectors nowadays. And in fact, for instance, METAL is one experiment that is running LSE, again, one of those um, eight, and PHASER as well. And I see, I think I, I saw a poster of PHASER uh, as I was walking through. So I guess one of you is working uh, there. That's also... Uh, employs uh, an emulsion detector. And this is exa an example of a more modern emulsion detector that is read out automatically by a camera. And, uh, and in this situation, however, once you have that type of interaction, that interaction is essentially irreversible. So you, once you have your charged particle going through, the only way to have a clean start again is to replace the detector with a new one. So it's very useful for very rare occurrences. So metal, for instance, is looking for very, very heavy ionizing particles that have a huge uh, equivalent charge. And since the ionization depends on the square of charge, you can look at something that deposits much more energy than is expected. And so that is expected to be very extremely rare if any such particle exists. So they don't care if they need to replace the detector. If they see five events like that, that's enough for a discovery. And they'll be happily replacing the detector for a new one. 
Okay. Um, but if you need to continuously look for particle, that's actually a bit inconvenient. And so, in fact, what is another after that, basically, the next generation detectors try to use ionization of a gas. So essentially, it was enclosing a gas in uh, in uh, in in, a, in creating an electric field between the cathode and the anode. And so, as the particle was going through, is going through, it it excites the electrons in the gas. Uh, in the gas, and then the fact that you have an electric field accelerates this electron that basically go on and, and get collected. In fact, um, you can compute essentially how fast this electron move, and, and in fact, as you create an electron, you also are left with an atom that basically is missing that electron, so will be positively charged and will also migrate in the other directions. That's called a hole. So both the electron and the hole actually migrate and can give us an electronic signal. The two move at different velocities, and depending on the gas, they, they can be more or less different. Very often, the electron signal is the one we, we, we look for uh, because it's the faster one. And, uh, and given the electric field and the pressure of the gas, you can compute the velocity. And therefore, computing the velocity, knowing the velocity, if I know what time the interactions happen and the particle is expected to arrive there, so I have an initial time, from the time it took, it, uh, it takes from the particle to ionize and to give me a signal, I can compute how much distance those electrons have traveled. And that essentially relates to where within this gas chamber uh, my particle was going through. So it essentially gives me a position within this tube of where the particle goes through. If the particle is going very close to the anode, I will see a signal right away. If the particle is very close to the end, the electrons will have to drift all the way through and I can, I can measure that. So that difference in time between an external reference determination of the collision time and the time where I see a signal can give me a position that is better than inside the tube, but it can give me a radial position of where the particle was, come, was going through, okay? Um, practically speaking, the, the, there is also a, lots of the ionization signals the, you only end up ionizing a relatively small amount of electrons. So that's a very tiny signal. So practically speaking, we take into, uh, we, we basically use the fact that the electric field for, for, such, a, uh, for such a setup is, is essentially increasing the lower is the radius, uh, the lower is the distance um, uh, to the central wire, such that if we, if we make a very tiny wire, the electric field becomes very, very, um, high, close to the wire. And so what happens is that our ionized electron actually gets accelerated, knocks out other electrons in the gas, further ionizing the gas, and essentially multiplies the signal, creating a, a sort of shower of electrons that then get recorded as a signal. That's a sort of multiplication of your signal that happens if you can make the, the smallest the wire you can take, the, the higher the electric field when you get closer, the higher the multiplication of that signal. And that's what makes this tiny signal from ionization actually detectable in our detectors. In fact, um, there are different regimes of this multiplication and there are detectors that work at various different regimes. So this is sort of, um, the, the, the multiplication factor, if you want, um, or yeah, the multiplication factor of, of your signal. And this is sort of as function of the potential that, that you apply. But the point is that of, is, is the way this curve works. So there are essentially different regimes that, um, that, that are basically usually labeled um, to, uh, to describe how these um, gas uh, ionization chambers work. There is a first that is the ionization regime, regime where there is very little to no multiplication. There is a proportional regime where you have some am amplification and that amplification is pretty proportional to the initial amount of charge. So it can be used to also relate to what was the initial amount of charge because the output signal is proportional to it. Um, there is a regime where the amplification becomes so large that actually it becomes way more smeared out in terms of like how well do I, can I relate the initial signal because I start increasing how much I, get, I multiply that signal. And finally, there is um, a region 
where essentially, regardless the input signal, I will end up always with a very large shower, which is essentially the fluctuation of how much of that shower happens is so much larger than regardless the, uh, the size of the input signal. So that is a, a situation where essentially any signal I'm sure will give me will give you heavily multiplied and I will be able to detect, but I will not be able to relate it to how much charge was initially deposited. Um, and after that, well, after that, the electric field is such usually that you have discharged through the gas. And at that point, it doesn't work anymore because you will adjust a continuous flow of current between your cathode and adult. Okay, I will keep going for just a little bit longer, but I'll, uh, I'll uh, wrap it up quickly. Um, because basically just the, the, the next, the obvious, um, the obvious uh, evolution of, of that tube is, to, okay, I can make many of these tubes and put them together. And this is sort of the, the so-called drift tubes. So this is an example of an actually what happens in an atlas muon spectrometer where I have many of these tubes that are filled with gas. And when the particle goes through, ionizes the gas and then the signal is connected uh, in the central wire. And these tubes are basically arranged together, packed, and, uh, and they are excellent tracking detector uh, that are used in the, in the muon spectrometer. Um, they're relatively slow in response. So this is basically the time it takes uh, for, this, for this detector to receive the signal. So you're seeing that it's, it's hundreds, up to hundreds of nanoseconds, the drift time, uh, depending on how far the, the particle is coming from the center. But that's also what allows you to determine very well how far from the center, from the central um, wire, the particle will pass through. And it means that it gives you excellent position resolution. Um, similarly, starting to have all so many tubes becomes easily um, quite problematic to manufacture and to put together. So the next obvious thing is like, well, do I really need individual tubes? Can I just create a whole plate, which is the analogous of my external part, my external conductor, and then I have all these single anode wires displaced, placed at separate at some equal distance. And then I read out this wire and then I fill the whole, um, the whole volume with gas. And that's basically this, the concept of this multi-wire proportional chamber, proportional because they work in this proportional multiplication regime where they, you're, you can relate very well the input ionization signal to the output signal. And essentially this is that sort of electric field you have in those chambers. So you have the two plates here and you have electric field and here you have the anode wire. And so where the multiplication happens around the wire very close to here. Um, and so when a particle goes through, we'll usually deposit a signal in actually more than one wire. And the fact that the amplitude of the signal in different wires allow us to figure out not only uh, geometrically the fact that the particle was in between the two, but the difference in amplitude between these two can give us an idea of where in between the two wires the particle was going through. That's why it's important to work in this proportional regime because the signal can give us an idea of the where the particle was going through in a better resolution than just the space <coughs> in the wire uh, using the information of the charge. Um, and here is an example of yet another gaseous detector that CMS is gonna use uh, for one of its upgrade. And this is essentially a similar concept, but works in a very higher multiplication regime and these are so-called gem detectors. These are foils in, uh, in which you essentially, um, they work in very, in avalanche mode. So in a very high multiplication, they are very fast, slightly less accurate, but you can chemically essentially create small holes in these plates and you can do that very, very accurately. So these allow to have very small space uh, holes. And when your electron ionization go, they go through the, these holes and that's when they get multiplied. And so if I did, did, did this gem detector for CMS, we'll have three of these different planes. As a particle ionizes, these electrons go through these holes and get multiplied very quickly and then get collected at the end uh, by an amplifier. Um, this, this is sort of yet another, another different concept. Um, 
I also saw a poster of RPC outside, uh, I think to be used for Codex P, so I will not go into huge detail, but this is another example of a fast detector um, in which you basically replace the individual wires with some uh, with a, the outside with just a layer that is conductive and then some spacing. And then you basically make the shower develop and a signal to be read out at the bottom. Um, these RPCs similar to JAM are very, very fast, less accurate. So you want to use them when you need a fast signal. And, and this is basically how you put all of this together. If you look at the immune system, for instance, in Atlas, similar to CMS, you actually don't have a single technology. You put together two, three different technologies depending on the needs. You want to have, for instance, in this case, we talked about these drift tubes, which are very well, very good position resolution, but are slow. And we alternate them uh, using RPC, this resistive plate chamber, which are very fast. So we use the very fast signal to figure out that there is something happening and the slow one to measure very accurately what is happening when the particle was going through. Um, and yeah, yet more technology have been used. There are actually you know, tens of different types of technology for gases detector. And we tend to sort of employ usually the best one depending on the single situation. When you go next to the beam, the radiation environment is much higher. So the repetition, the amount of signal you need to record is higher. And so some technology is better than the other. You give up a bit of resolution but you can sustain a higher rate. Uh, but they all work with the same principle that I just explained. They are just different compromises. Okay. Um, and this is just to show why do I care about measuring mu and the high momentum is because uh, analysis of this type, we're looking for instance, for a very high mass Z prime, um, they, they need to reconstruct momentum of mu on that are as high as one TV. And, uh, and the, the, the choice of, of having um, large volumes in this immune system is what, as we will see, give us the ability to have a good momentum resolution and good resolution in the end on the invariant mass of possible new particles that might show up in this spectrum. Um, and this is just to say that moving to ILUM LHC, actually we still need that because even if the energy is not going high, because of the proton-proton structure, more luminosity means that we can probe highest energy as well. Okay, and I think um, I'm gonna probably, I think we have enough for today, it's at 4.15. I'm gonna stop here, um, yeah, and then we continue uh, tomorrow uh, with the rest of the tracking detectors. <laughs>